Thank you. All right, 6.03, let's get started again. Um, if you're gonna focus and you're, you're cramped on time, I would focus on the first half of this lecture. I feel like the yield is higher. Or if I maybe manipulate you a little bit, it's easier to get the questions right on the first part of the lecture than it is on the second part. We start going from what is our bread and butter neuro to some you know muscular dystrophies and neuromuscular diseases and all that will start to do this. And I would not focus studying on, on that. When those patients come in your real life, you're gonna look it up anyway to make sure you don't mess it up. The basic principles that we're gonna talk about now and mostly yesterday though will apply in everything you do, so you have to know those things. A little bit more about brain protection. Um, if you had the slides from yesterday, let me pause for a minute. I, you know, I, we continuously edit these things. I've changed a couple of points. I'll have the guys reload them. That maybe matter. I, they're not. It wasn't that it was wrong. It's that the emphasis should have been shifted, and I should have caught it last time. Um, but you know, all of this is evolution. All right. So hypothermia after cardiac arrest is still largely done. The enthusiasm has come down, but I think across the country, this is still something attempted. Just like yesterday, extrapolation to the neuro, everything else seems like it would work, and then it doesn't really seem to work. So the same principle and mantra applies. Avoidance of hyperthermia, I can defend pretty well. Hypothermia probably maybe does something, but don't get carried away with it. Don't cause a coagulopathy or an arrhythmia because you're trying to be so adherent to the philosophy of hypothermia. You can't defend it well enough. You're very familiar with us not using even a little bit of... Uh, glucose solutions if we can help it, which most of the time you can in the neurologic cases. Keep in mind there's effect on metabolism even if you maintain euglycemia in an injured brain. So this is why we avoid it. I can't just make the argument that, well, I'll just make sure they don't get hyperglycemic and it won't be a problem. All right. Barbiturate coma is used less and less, but we still do it fairly routinely here for severe TBI patients. This is an attempt to control ICP that's refractory. Essentially, once you live through this with me, you'll get pretty good at it. And when you come through the ICU, we'll talk about this, and it'll make you more comfortable. If you bought rotate through in the summer, then you'll almost certainly end up taking care of these patients directly yourself. Barbiturate coma can help control seizures, seizures. But the main question and life lesson about uh, pinnabar coma is that it doesn't actually improve mortality. So it does improve ICP. In the patients that it does not improve ICP, guess what happens? They die. So if you induce pinnabar coma and the ICP is still 50, they're not survivable, okay? And we can use that to talk to the family. There's no benefit in using pinnabar the way you would use hypothermia after cardiac arrest. The way to remember this is this is not something we do. You and I are not used to going to a cardiac ICU and providing anesthesia or doing a pinnabar protocol or anything like that. Steroids. You have to have in your head, you've heard me say it's a cardinal sin to give steroids and TBI at this point. There's more consistent, I'm just quoting my own slide here, there's more consistent evidence of harm and increased mortality. So this is one of the shifts from uh, Dr. Shell's slides. It's not just that it's not the right answer, it's that mortality increases. So when we talk about avoidance of hyperthermia, attaining euthermia or targeting hypothermia, and I talked about how logically you can mess that up, Avoidance of hyperthermia is not the same thing as inducing hypothermia. The same thing here applies. Of using decadron or not is not a, eh, I don't know. It's just not going to hurt anything. I'll give some. It's actually increasing the patient's mortality. Therefore, it's the wrong answer, okay? <clears throat> Spinal cord injury is more debatable. We do it very rarely here. There are cert it comes down to the individual surgeon or anesthesia person on how, which way they want to take it. In my opinion, I can more effectively prove side effects and risk and ICU complications from uh, methylprednisolone uh, algorithm or protocols, then I can't benefit, so I don't use it. That's a philosophy approach though. Let's do, we're gonna have a little more uh, test questions today because the second day is always a little bit harder, right? <clears throat> Which of the following is most consistent with brain death? Um, and this is physical exams. So this is a CODA situation in the OR. So you go into the OR to, for organ procurement, and one of these things happens. 
If three of these things happens, that means you've made a very big mistake and it's time to turn around. If one of them happens, you should see that coming and most of us have the belief that you should prophylax it. Does anyone know what the correct answer is to the question this phrase? Yeah, exactly. And why is there movement to surgical incision? It's a spinal reflex essentially, right? Um, in a different setting, I have slides where you can show, and I've shown this to you in Grand Rounds, where you can show that a decapitated um, animal of some kind still has the same MAC level uh, with an anesthetic because it's based in spinal cord movement to surgical incision, okay? I also recommend when you do those cases, you at least do part of a brain death exam before you take them back just because that moment will be one of the worst moments in your life if the patient coughs, okay. <clears throat> uh, brain death is mostly focused on the brain stem. When you spend time with me, I very put a lot of effort into trying to differentiate anterior from posterior signs, exams, circulation, all of that, because it makes your thinking easier. When you come and talk to neurosurgery or neurology, it's easier to have the conversation if you can speak the same language, okay? That's why I emphasize it. Um, Obviously, they have to be in a coma. They can't be talking to you. Too easy. No response to pain. Remember, they might have a spinal cord injury. So you can do supraorbital or mandibular pressure here so it's really painful and look for a grimace. If they're quadriplegic at this point, you're not gonna get half of your exam, okay? So you have to remember that. <clears throat> Absence of the brainstem reflex is the, is the majority of the test. They're all listed here. What I recommend is you print off our protocol and put it on the patient's chest and just read through it in real time so that you can prove you did everything and didn't forget one little step that could be catastrophic. Apnea testing, um, we only do once. The brain death, the rest of the clinical exam is repeated by a separate person. We only do one set of apnea testing. The idea here is that breathing, as you might guess, is very resistant. And when we lose the rest of the brain stem, cough, gag, for example, pupillary reactions, we usually are sitting here waiting for them to stop the patient to stop over breathing the vent. All right. So kind of the last step, let's make sure the brain stem's really completely gone, is to not provide ventilation and just provide supplemental oxygenation and see if that diaphragm starts to fire off or not. If the patient is exam is clinically consistent with brain death in everything but apnea testing, the patient's still not brain dead. You just have to wait longer. Now, it doesn't mean they'll progress the rest of the way, but usually that's how it plays out. So we'll wait. We'll just come back the next morning and do the exam again. This is a consult I get. <clears throat> the patient failed, or the patient breathed during the apnea testing. Does that mean I need to go get an ancillary test? No. The patient's not brain dead yet. You just have to wait. Okay? So don't be the person that calls me and says, so which way do I do this? Because it's a big deal. Okay. The confirmatory test, for the most part, we do tagged red cell studies here. You can do a four vessel angiogram but that involves an entire team. Use of a OR suite essentially, so we don't do it very often. We talked about EEG yesterday. There are very detailed notes here that we don't need for a 6 a.m. Um, but some of those changes are, and the fact that a BIS can be zero in brain dead patients all contribute to the fact that we don't use it at UK just like we said yesterday. TCDs can be used. That's the table versus the reverberation. Does that sound familiar? <clears throat> essentially reinforcing the same points. Apparently I care about this. Which of the following is most consistent diagnosis of death by neurologic criteria? So now we're looking for essentially the same question. So the way I see this the pupil's still reacting, then the brainstem's still firing. If there's a corneal reflex, it's essentially the same question, right? If they're grimacing with supraorbital pressure, also the same. So the outlier is ankle extension with pressure. These are the spinal cord reflexes. And it has, there have been patients, I can remember one specifically with Pittman, where he thought it was spinal cord reflex. I was not convinced, so I simply said, I can't be the conformatory brain death exam. Find somebody else. Someone else will agree with you. I just don't. No big deal, we have hundreds of doctors here. <clears throat> Another uh, question emphasizing some of the stuff from yesterday, so I'm sorry if you weren't here yesterday, you haven't read it yet. Ancillary tests most supportive of death by neurologic criteria. 
the burst suppression on EEG won't cut it. The Lycox or brain tissue oxygenation monitor it won't be specific enough. Of course, it's a, a, a as inflammatory tissue evolves around the catheter, it loses its predictive use over about seven days anyway. So you're not certainly going to declare someone brain dead based on that. The what is the what's C refer to? If we're to integrate with yesterday, you remember what that's called? The MCA to ICA ratio is the Lindegard ratio to differentiate hyperemia in a subarachnoid hemorrhage patient from cerebral vasospasm. spasm. Okay. All this will start to link in your head soon. The correct answer is what I just said, the reverberating flow, not no flow in the TCD. Okay. Moving on to uh, some other high yield things. We're doing fewer sitting cases uh, for posterior uh, neurosurgery. The main complication that we talk about and has been classically talked about for all time is venous air embolism. The last one, and I think the only one I've ever done, we uh, in real time on that day checked for a PFO like you would in, a, in CT. <clears throat> These are the complications you have to know. From my perspective, most of them are very intuitive. If the head's up here and you, you have a craniotomy site like this, and there's the stents itself open, kind of like the subclavian stays open. That's why the risk is so high. Even though we do, you know, DBS in a similar position every day, and we only rarely see a venous air embolism. The quadriplegia is simply because you're doing this, just like you've seen us do posterior fossa surgery, just laying down. The sciatic stretch is pretty intuitive, I think. If you just look at this chair, you can see how easy it would be to pull on that nerve. All right, so you can picture that during the exam. The kinky of the endotracheal tube is something I, I talk a lot about, and I ask them every time when we're doing some kind of posterior, how much head flexion are you going to do? Because once you kink that tube, you, you, there is no straightening it back out, okay? You'll have to break pins, and it'll be an emergency. Throw an Ioban over it, flip it, it, it'll be terrible. So you need to see that coming before it happens. Um, I've told you before, I've, had, I've seen an anesthesia stat for it. And with Richard Luck and I starting some emergency, we didn't think the head was like that, but we instantly locked in and airway pressures peaked. And we all looked at it and said, there's no way. Unlock the pins slightly, I mean, almost nothing, extend the pins just enough that the tube did this and everything was normal again, all right? So as long as you know that might happen, it's very easy. Tension pneumocephalus, um, we won't get into that too much, but this is, I've seen it a couple of times where someone doesn't wake up, we run them off to scan, and we have bi-hemisphere pressure, uh, which, stops the function of the hemispheres and leads to slow awakening. <clears throat> this is something that we seem to talk about every day in, in neuro. Where do you put the transducer? Remember the 0.74 ratio between the millimeters of mercury and the centimeters of water. When you're doing the DBS cases, which is more of a lounge chair, you still have to consider that. The true sitting position though, I mean, what do we use as an illustration at 30 centimeters? That's enough to make a mistake and hypoperfuse the brain. <clears throat> I asked this a couple of days ago to somebody. Do you know where the A-line needs to be zeroed? I got this wrong once and I don't like to be wrong. It actually doesn't matter where you zero. It matters where you measure it, which is the whole point of these slides right here. But the atmospheric pressure between here and here is so we would never be able to tell the difference in that. Okay, So don't go out of your way to measure it right by the tragus when you're ready to transport. It's okay. Four zeroing, I mean. So let's see. Cases at risk for venous air emboli. The most common place where I see it is the DBS cases because we do such a high volume. I've only seen a few where we've either called somebody or, or anesthesia stat to help stabilize it. The key to interact or emergently managing it is to flood the field to stop the air from entraining and then provide supportive care. Okay. The big thing that you'll see is if they're awake, they'll cough. Okay. If they're not awake, then you'll see a CO2 gradient. So essentially your CO2 on your end tidal will drop off precipitously. Like, wh wh where did that just go? That's the best clue that I've seen in real time. And your hypoxemia will ensue. Okay. This is the kind of thing where you just need to read through it a couple of times and it becomes fairly intuitive. And all the questions seem to fall together. In terms of how we diagnose <coughs> diagnose of anus area embolism, this graph is asked about in every way, and every time I take a test, this thing seems to come up. Which of the following is most sensitive detector of venous air embolism? T, okay. We 
do use a precordial Doppler that we get from one of the nearby hospitals when we rarely do these cases. Uh, I do it mostly so I can prove that I, I knew what was going on. It's hard to leave a TEE probe in, in a patient who's like this, 180 degrees away from you, and we're going to surgery doesn't want you manipulating and moving around there. So the precordial Doppler is the next best thing that we use. <clears throat> In terms of how can you treat the air embolism, most of it's supportive. We rarely use multilateral orifice catheters anymore, but this is what people want to hear you say. Uh, they're actually, to my understanding, they're custom manufactured. So if I have a case coming up, they're, they're used so rarely they don't mass produce them anymore. So they give you one that they've made by hand for you. It's kind of neat. But it also means the quality isn't very good. Um, we use pieces from the real kits, the mass produced kits because the uh, items that were in the kit were so much lower quality than what we were used to. And we decided the last time we did one just to not do it this way anymore, okay? <clears throat> How do you know, this is still high yield, that you position the catheter in the appropriate place and what is the appropriate place to suck out air? That part's pretty intuitive, I think. You're not gonna wanna put all the way down to the bottom of the ventricle if you're gonna suck out air. Plus, obviously, it just cause you other problems anyway. So this. If the sinoatrial node is here, you can use that and the shape of the P wave to localize. So there's an EKG. These are the old, if you've heard the term long arm CVP that the older guys did, this is what they would do routinely. Instead of going through the IJ, they go through the brachiocephalic here and then just march up here and know they were there based on the EKG tracing. What do we really do now? Just look at a TEE, put it down there, look at the tip of the catheter, pull it back out at the sinoatrial junction where it would intuitively be most useful to you. I think it, yeah, it did come up in my oral exam and I, uh, when I was taking the exam, I mean, and I de-emphasized the utility on that and much more emphasized the utility of supportive care and chest compressions and that kind of thing. You absolutely can try sucking out air, but I wouldn't interfere, let that interfere with basic resuscitation, if that makes sense. The catheter is only very small. It, it, it's probably not as practical as we want to make it feel like it is. In terms of, from my perspective, <clears throat> all I looked for in the tracing on the test questions was the biphasic P wave. And if they had that, then I looked to see if there was one where essentially it was the catheter backed up slightly. They'll either ask, what, are you targeting this or where does it actually go? The answer is it actually goes where the P wave has come back up. Meaning just go to the biphasic and pull back a centimeter and call it a day. Okay. So I'm not sure which way the question will be phrased. This is just an old chart as most of this says here provide supportive care what I've done a few times with uh, Van Horn for DBS is if we have a small air embolism which is usually diagnosed with me by EKG changes just acute all you know someone sitting there no problems at all and then their EKG starts to have a T wave inversion I ask him to flood the field then he asks me is everything okay yep we're stabilized it's all back to normal and do you want me to lower the head right because then what does that do? The gradient, essentially the force, if you, not physically speaking, the force of air trying to get in will go down if the gradient between the entry point and the heart is less. So what I usually do is, no, that was not a bad one at all. If I didn't kind of love to read about this and teach about this, I wouldn't have noticed it. I wouldn't have realized it was an air embolism. If it happens again though, I say, yeah, now you're gonna have to stoop over to do your surgery because we don't, I can't really defend having someone get hurt. <clears throat> I have seen one on the same patient where they're two, like real, we almost had to do CPR cases. Um, that patient came out fine without any complications. We just had to lower the head really down and they operated in a chair instead. Okay. Posterior fossa surgery in a 46 year old. When you see that stem, the first thing you're gonna think is venous air embolism posterior fossa and they've emphasized the height of the head above the heart. For me, the only reason I would even look at the vital signs was to confer that they weren't trying to throw me off by the stem, okay? <clears throat> the key here is posterior fossa and what the vital sign changes are. So we know the stem set up as a venous air embolism question, which is one of the distractors. The problem with what I see here is the entitled CO2 is painfully stable. I told you I see EKG changes, which is subtle, and if it's real, like real clinically relevant, 
then the, the CO2 falls off precipitously, correct? So I essentially ruled that out, even though they set it up that way. So I thought, well, that's kind of a neat way to write a question. That's not how you usually write them. So then the only thing that's left that's a major change is acute onset bradycardia, A to 38. When you do neuro, you've seen this a thousand times. I mean, every time they squish the brain, this happens. So all it is is posterior surgery. They're operating. They squish the brain stem. Reflexes kick in, probably through the vagus, because it's always the right answer, right? And the heart rate slows down. And you say, would you stop hurting the patient? They take their hands off. It goes back to normal. The nerve desensitizes, so it gets less and less of a problem. Or you give a little glyco to balance, shift the balance of the vagus activity. Shifting again, spinal cord transection. Um, you have to know these. This is, <laughs> I don't think this is too hard to know with the kind of work we do. The phrenic nerve is C345. Cardio accelerators, T1 through 4, stuff that we talk about every single day. T6 is sort of the magic number where autonomic hyperreflexia becomes very relevant. T10, it's still an issue. So depending on how the question's written, you've got to keep both of those in mind. The difference here is not actually that critical uh, in, the, in this chart. The idea is that spinal shock is the time before when autonomic hyperreflexia is relevant. So essentially when we have a spinal cord case, which we obviously do very frequently with a spinal cord injury, I'm not even thinking about autonomic hyperreflexia for the majority of those because these are acute or subacute stabilization procedures while the spinal cord is going to get better over time. The patients that come back later, the patients that are in uh, a rehab facility, those are the times we start to worry about it. And usually even the patient knows about this. They say, yeah, sometimes when I have to urinate, my blood pressure gets super high. It's like, right, we know all about that, and that's a risk that for your surgery that we have to talk about. The only time I've seen this was when I was a little kid, Wayne Scott was staffing Cysto, high risk, and the key there was we don't put an A-line in. I mean, it was a very short case but the heart rate went down. So the mistake clinically is to treat the heart rate and not realize that's reflex kicking in, baroreceptors, and a hypertensive crisis, and then bradycardia, okay? So don't be the person who goes, oh, the heart rate's low, I'll give some epi. So the heart rate's not low and the blood pressure's really high now, it's the wrong answer. What do you do? Nitro is fine, nicardipine would be fine. In reality, you just need to deepen the anesthetic so that they don't have as much reaction to that. <clears throat> This whole slide is about that. It's kind of confusing because you have some signals coming through and not other signals coming through. So I just teach it as compromised signal transduction. So the brain knows <clears throat> there is something going on but can't keep its balance very well, sends down a massive sympathetic re response, and we get hypertensive and bradycardic. And this is Dr. Bo, one of Dr. Foe's favorite answers for an oral board examinee patient was bradycardic above and normal card, you know, so it doesn't work. And that's what inspired this question. T5 means autonomic hyperreflexia jumps in your head immediately. Cystoscopy means they're probably going with autonomic hyperreflexia. Oh, then they tell you autonomic hyperreflexia, so you've wasted your cognitive energy. So all they have to do is know something about cognitive hyper, I mean, uh, autonomic hyperreflexia. <coughs> It doesn't manifest 72 hours after the injury because we would talk about it every day in the spine rooms, and there's a lot of spines. Neuraxial anesthesia will not block. I'm not saying that's guaranteed, but yeah, we do spinals preferentially in these to make sure we don't have any of that, sim that signal coming through. Hypertension and bradycardia, you just heard me talk about separately. The patients, if they experience these things, like I said, if they're retaining urine and they start to feel something, a lot of times they'll talk about how they get flushed above the lesion, okay? So acute vasoconstriction here, body dysfunctional signals, while well, tries to compensate by vasodilating here so they get stuffy nose and, and a flushed face. Ischemic optic neuropathy, we have a little understanding of this. We mostly have big data to guide us a little bit. You essentially need to prove that you balance crystalloid and colloid consumption you need to do long, high blood volume or fluid resuscitation cases in phases. Now that we have Dr. Vasquez here, as you see this, we do two-day spines now. This is one of the primary reasons. <clears throat> Deliberate hypotension is not used as much anymore. Um, I've seen an informal survey where almost nobody in the room was still using it. 
it has not been proven to be a risk but also keep in mind if you're compromising perfusion and something that has a word ischemia in it at least physiologically speaking that's probably still relevant heavy on the questions huh all right um, worst headache of life means subarachnoid hemorrhage to you when you're taking a test confirmed with subarachnoid blood and the posterior circulation she acutely declines while you go down to see her in the ER what caused this so all of these are correct answers for neurocritical care stuff that happens so you can't rule one out because it's just irrelevant you know subarachnoid hemorrhage or you will know is linked to cerebral salt wasting but that's there's no reason to think that's going to cause a change in 10 minutes right in front of you cerebral vasospasm can do that absolutely true but we're talking about a fresh bleed that's more of a four to two week kind of four days to two weeks kind of thing and we have lots of monitors that we've already talked about to help us get an idea if that's high risk or not delirium well I mean she just got here that doesn't seem very feasible she's also 44 years old which leaves acute hydrocephalus so the CSF production is still occurring swelling may be starting to assume she may have progressive bleeding which we can see on the imaging and she's starting to trap outflow so this is something we see all the time I did a subdural two days ago that was in the OR mostly because she was starting to trap her ventricle how do you treat ICP this will be on exams for the rest of your life <clears throat> hyper intracranial hypertension we mostly use the magic number 20 if you've rotated with me you know 20 is the answer to most things in neuro don't use D5W which is hypoosmotic make sure you have in your head the difference between osmotic and oncotic because I've seen that come up too everything with neuro and mannitol is osmo osmosis okay you can of course just pull CSF out although we usually teach it as CO2 is the fastest way to manipulate the ICP like we talked about yesterday well I can't imagine it's any faster than literally just pulling CSF out of the brain okay there's a few problems with that um, it's still a catheter and it's still just basic physics it's basically a drain so it can actually suck out enough CSF that it collapses around the catheter and although the brain's really tight you kind of lost any advantage you get of sucking out CSF okay and you can imagine having a young person how just the blood and the swelling from the injury is more than enough that you couldn't suck out enough CSF anyway and you'll see this in the ICU fr frequently Manitol may be Lasix. Lasix is used a lot less than when these slides were written. It more than it consistently lowers your ICP or reduces brain bulk, it causes hypovolemia, no surprise there, and electrolyte problems. So I only give Lasix the, the real indication at this point is someone who's at risk for heart failure from the intravascular expansion from getting the Manitol. If someone has a bad EF or a history of CHF, maybe then I'll give a little Lasix to help you diurese that off before the volume overload causes pulmonary edema this is one of the slides that I sent uh, that I changed the emphasis was on the diuresis the diuresis is a secondary gain it has no actual direct benefit to the brain relaxation in fact there are studies looking at aneuric patients and giving them mannitol and you still get brain bulk reduction right which if you think about how the mannitol works it makes perfect sense <clears throat> osmotic not oncotic you need an intact brain barrier but of course that's not true either because most of your patients won't have an intact brain barrier the point is the physics can't work without an without a barrier for osmosis to be driven across that's what that means okay <clears throat> when you see the hyponatremia shortly after giving your mannitol remember don't text me and say oh, man I know we need a higher sodium to help relax the brain and the sodium comes back at 130 It'll, it'll be fine in a minute. What you're seeing is that water shifting and it's a dilutional effect. At least that's good enough to answer the test questions correct. <clears throat> Lasix, as I mentioned yesterday, actually uh, decreases CSF production. It also does another, a lot of other things that you see listed here, like the vasodilation, hypotension inductions, that can help unload some of the pressure, help venous outflow, and lower the brain bulk by itself as well. The clinical effect I, probably is not much at all. Corticosteroids is more specific for the tumors because of the vasogenic edema. You need to link the words tumor, vasogenic edema, and decadron in, in our case. Tumor, metastases, vasogenic. But there are other types of edema too that come up and show up on your test questions. I just listed here. Cytotoxic, 
of course, any injury can have other components, but the way to keep it very straight in your head is the TBI patient has cytotoxic damage. That's easy to think about, direct damage to the cell from whatever bullet hit the head, okay? <clears throat> Interstitial cerebral edema is related to flow, so your hydrocephalus shunt kind of patients. Vasogenic edema was tumor, so I'm just repeating it so it reinforces it. And then osmotic is another version of the interstitial cerebral edema. Think about a uh, high osmotic pressure. So someone who's blood pressure, or I'm sorry, a high uh, hydrostatic pressure. You're still gonna have chemistry apply and the brain barrier is gonna try to keep it safe, but this is why you can have cerebral edema just because you let the pressure get to 200 for a very short amount of time. This slide is an excerpt from something Jeff and I wrote. No, you're not expected to read that. What you need for the test questions that always will show up is to be able to differentiate DI, SIADH, and cerebral salt wasting. The way these are written is to give you so much data it becomes overwhelming, okay? So if I, yesterday I spoke about how you have to, sometimes it's easier just to dichotomize something because if there's only four distractors, you can at least rule out one or sometimes two just by that simple thing. So take, I never did very well at learning renal physiology. So if I ask you on rounds, what part of the kidney does Lasix work in? I know the answer because it's the drug I use the most. I don't even know everything about it, but I know which part it's in. Does anyone know? No, nah, that's, that's much better. And by knowing that means that if I see that distractor on Gumex, then I can rule one out right there, even though I don't know how Bumex works. Does that make sense? These little anchor points for your brain can really increase your scores. That's what I want you to learn from looking at these charts. So what I've done is put everything together right next to each other so that you can start to see the patterns. And the questions become very simple. So you either you have two that have low <clears throat> serum sodium. The other side of that coin is intravascular volume. Okay, so DI has low intravascular volume because they're urinating off a bunch of free water. Cerebral salt wasting has low intravascular volume because they're urinating off a bunch of salt water. SIDH is the opposite direction then because they're all in groups of two, not three, meaning you have normal volumia or hypervolemia in SIDH. All right. The alternative way to look at it is the serum sodium or osmolality. <clears throat> in DI, because they're urinating off free fluid, I expect the serum sodium to start to increase unless it's corrected. In SIDH, I expect the serum serum to be just diluted out. It's actually more complicated than that, but dilutional because I'm retaining all this free water. So that sodium goes down. And cerebral salt wasting, here's the other of the two. If the salt's being wasted, well then of course the salt goes down, so the serum sodium is down. The reason these questions are so hard to keep straight is I couldn't group any of those. These two were grouped on the volume, these two were grouped on the sodium, so your brain goes, oh man, I have 250 questions I've got to get through, I'm just gonna pick salt wasting because it's subarachnoid hemorrhage, all right? The key here is to just figure out which side the volume's on and the sodium's on, then you're down to two, so you already have your distractors narrowed down, and then if you think about serum osmolality, you'll get the rest of the way there. I don't find any utility in the urine electrolytes except for the specific gravity. This is too much for us to actually teach you right now, but if you've heard this before, it'll just remind your brain some on it. So this slide tells you everything you need to know to keep it straight. You just have to review these things unless you work in the ICU. If you go to my office, there's actually a version of this hanging up on somewhere in there so that I don't get confused when I have to see these every now and then or when people start asking me about them. To reinforce a little bit more here, so traumatic brain injury, probably not going to be salt wasting because I told you that links to SA, uh, SAH might be DI because if you damage the pituitary in the process, a very bad TBI, we very commonly will start checking pituitary labs to make sure we don't miss that. It's actually missed very commonly. SIDH is useless because it's like uh, lupus. It could be associated with anything, so I don't know what to do with that. So everything, pain or treatment of pain can be associated with SIDH. So the test question mostly leads me to DI because it's a traumatic brain injury. Then they're talking about urine output. Okay, if it's high, oh, really high, then that's down DI pathway too. Then what happens? I wasted my cognitive energy because it just says it's diabetes insipidus. 
Which of the following is most consistent with that? Specific gravity and DI go together, and it's a low specific gravity. DI urinates off free water, so that's probably the correct answer. Then I'll just very quickly make sure the other ones aren't correct so that I don't have the chance to get one right that I would have missed. High urine sodium, it's DI, that doesn't make any sense. Cerebral salt wasting probably has that though. High BNP, well they're hypovolemic because they're peeing off all this urine, so there's no reason to think that they have a high BNP. Low serum osmolality, no, they're concentrating their serum down because of all the free fluid loss, all right? I know it was painful, but it's gonna reinforce it for your head. You have to think about transmural pressures in any patients with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Conveniently, the equation is the same as MAT minus I ICP. When, I, when we induce for coilings, every time I work with you, I say, okay, I'm uh, mass ventilating the patient, but I'm avoiding hyperventilating so I don't reduce the CO2, therefore reducing the ICP, therefore increasing transmural pressure. But it becomes very easy. Essentially, when we put a lumbar drain in to help in these cases, we're very conscious to be very careful not to drain off too much because as my ICP drops from the CSF diversion, my transmural pressure is essentially going to go up. So it's two sides of a wall. My blood pressure is the main one because it can go extremes and it's the one I can manipulate most easily. The other side of the wall is the ICP, which you're only talking about a few points. Those few points can be the difference between rupture or not or re-rupture or not. Um, by far, I would much rather you focus on controlling the blood pressure, not letting it spike up acutely during BL. Gap in knowledge, so you, it's a high yield one that will come back, and it means that most of us don't understand that very well. So, rebleeding versus vasospasms, kind of what we were getting at earlier. You have to use the timing to decide to, uh, to help you shift differentials. Rebleeding happens early. This is why those are all emergency cases where we try to get them done the same day. So we can li essentially eliminate the risk of rebleeding because the aneurysm is secured. Vasospasms a little bit later. It's an ICU issue. You will still see these patients. If the patient's very sick, they'll ask anesthesia to help provide uh, hemodynamic support during the case. For the most part, the ICU team will take care of this. <clears throat> Triple H therapy is not a thing anymore. You'll still see it in books, though, so be careful with that. The idea here is the patient has to be uvolemic. We can use hypertension and hyperdynamicity, that's probably a word, to increase pressure through the narrow blood vessels to keep the, the tissue distal from getting ischemic. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's essentially the way to think about it. And you can walk into somebody who's having vasospasm, maybe they're hemiplegic, bolus, 100 mics of phenylephrine, and watch their symptoms get better in front of you. Okay? It's very reinforcing, helps you understand what's happening and how urgent it is. It's one of the main complications. This is why we, literally why we keep them in the ICU for approximately two weeks, why they get daily TCDs, why they're on uvolemia protocol, why they get nemotipine. There are a lot of reasons all based around this vasospasm that these patients are interesting. Another question regarding cerebral aneurysm. So I'm going to think SAH, salt wasting maybe? Nope, it's a transmural pressure question. Okay, that's how I take the test question, or how I take the test. And this is simply think MAP minus ICP and you'll get the answer correct. So, does wall tension decrease if the blood pressure shoots through the roof? Well, no, of course not. Okay. <clears throat> does wall de tension decrease if you drain off CSF? Well, if I lower this side, then the relative tension across the wall means it's actually up. Okay. Does wall tension increase with the increased size of the aneurysm? Oh, this is actually a complicated question because now we're talking about Laplace, right, I think. And does wall tension increase with mild hypercapnia? No, I was talking about how that will happen if I hyperventilate. So essentially, we'll do awake A lines on someone with a giant aneurysm or one that I decide is big or stressful. If it's little three millimeter aneurysm, then we'll usually do it asleep just to, for the patient's comfort and be very careful with the induction. So increased size is increased wall stress. Very easy to remember. Pituitary tumors, this is when I start to lose you a little bit. Um, you have to keep a, some of these in mind. Remember acromegaly is always asked about the unexpected difficult airway based on physical exam. So the acromegalic patients I've taken care of, every time I say, well, we'll put a glide scope in here, but boy, he sure looks good externally. And then routinely I, I put the blade in the mouth and I go, oh yeah, I'm glad I had a glide scope not to recommend glide scope over anything else, a video scope. What I tend to say is that the tissues don't move the way you expect them to and everything's enlarged. You already knew everything's enlarged. You do an external exam, the jaws move forward. 
The airway looks like it's going to be fine, but the tissues just don't move and manipulate as easily. The displacement therefore gets compromised, so your airway curves get compromised. Cushing's disease, I usually teach this uh, in the context of adrenal insufficiency. For me, if I can think about Cushing's and adrenal insufficiency as sort of opposite of each other's, I can start getting all the test questions right. Okay, we won't get into that, but there are many lectures I've given you on adrenal insufficiency and Cushing to help make it clearer in your head. If you want to see that again, um, just email me and I'll, I'll send you some more. ECT, you have to know contraindications. Most of those are very intuitive. If they just had an MRI, they probably don't need to have a massive sympathetic stress. The phases have to be known. They essentially are parasympathetic briefly and then it gets sympathetic. Once you know that, you can answer the rest of the questions. Okay. Methahexatol or Brevitol is the main agent used. Atomidate's okay. Most protocols I see use succinylcholine for that bradycardia episode, glycopyrrolate's used very commonly. Propofol is probably not the right answer because what do we get when somebody seizes? We run them on propofol. So it shortens the seizure duration. The duration of the seizure is one of the main things that predicts the eff efficacy of the treatment. All right. Parkinson's is simply a dopamine and cholinergic ratio. If you start thinking like that, you'll get the questions correctly. That's why we have certain drugs we avoid in the Parkinson's patients. We don't use as much metoclopramide anymore because it's moved down or off of the post-op nausea vomiting treatments. Uh, but Druperidol and Phenergan are still used, so keep that in mind. There are CNS changes with aging. The one that was a uh, gap in knowledge a few years ago is that there is increased permeability of the dura. So the dura itself changes, which affects the anesthetics. I don't know that I would have gotten that question right either. <clears throat> the peripheral nerve injury is high. As you know, it's the very common cause of a uh, lawsuit and close claim da database. The ulnar neuropathy is the top. You just have to find a way to remember these. So again, if you just do dichotomization, I know wrist drop because it has an R sound in it and radial nerve injury. Well, if I only have four distractors, that got me really close to trying to remember which one's the ulnar, what does it actually look like? and I don't know if I have that completely in my head. I've written a lot of test questions on it, but I, I still don't know if I, if I know it very well. Um, median nerve dysfunction, the way to remember that is the opposition in your nerve stimulator. That kind of links it in my head pretty easily. And then the lower extremity, using the lithotomy is the highest yield thing to know. That is our time. Thank you all very much for coming.